Thank you, Yara. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you, Yara. Cheers. All right, welcome, welcome. Thank you for uh, coming to my talk and taking time out of your day. I appreciate that. I'll try and stand out the way of, get that out of the way of there. Good, can you all hear me okay? Brilliant, good, thank you and welcome. So um, I'm gonna be talking about real world expedition with bushcraft skills. So how I use bushcraft skills, how I work on bushcraft skills and how I use them for trips and some lessons I've learned from trips about what's useful um, I've done some talks which overlap with this in previous bushcraft shows. I kind of almost think of these bushcraft shows as a series of talks now. I've been here for about five years in a row and, um, and I will refer back to some previous ones and they're all on my website so um, you, can, you can see those there if you've not seen them already. Um, so I have a company called Frontier Bushcraft and that's my training company, I do all my training and the overseas expeditions that we do with clients through that company. I also have a blog at paulkirtley.co.uk and as of tomorrow evening, after the show finishes, any of the resources that I refer to or articles or things, um, if you're interested in getting the links um, rather than me give them all to you now, just go to paulkirtley.co.uk bushcraft show 2018, that, live, uh, that link will be live as of tomorrow evening after the show finishes and you can get all of the resources that I might refer to in this show. So you can now just focus on what I'm talking about. Good, so I'm Paul Kirtley. Um, believe it or not, that's me. A um, bit skinnier back then. That was on the West Highland Way back in the early 1990s. And I was heavily into backpacking then. And I did a lot of backpacking on my own and with friends. Um, I've always liked the journey and for me that's in a way how I see my bushcraft skills in the context of making journeys. Um, but of course um, over the years I've looked at many different ways of journeying. Um, canoeing is something that has become a passion certainly in the last decade and some of the context that I'll give you this evening is about canoeing. Also winter trips. Um, canoe trips as I say some of them easier than others, winter trips, ski tours, and snowshoeing toboggan type tours. And all of them I have found bushcraft to be really, really, really useful in different ways. Okay, I think it's worth pointing out a couple of different contexts. Expeditions, where your main aim is to go and train in skills to find out about how to operate in particular environments and expeditions where you're really aiming to travel. So for a lot of people it might be an adventure just to go out for an overnight in their own country. You know I remember when I first went out and and camped when I was a, a young lad it was a real adventure. It, it was a real expedition in that sense. Um, one person's expedition is another person's ordeal. It's easy for some people that have got a lot of experience. For other people, it's something to aspire to. We're all on a journey in that sense. And I think it's important to remember that. Don't poo-poo what somebody else thinks is a real aspirational challenge. We're all learning and getting experience as we go. So the, if you've never been out and spent time out, then going and spending some nights out in your local environment is a good way to start building up skills um, for going on to bigger journeys. And then you can go and do plenty of great trips in this country. So this is a photograph from the Spey. Some of you here have done trips with me and Ray Goodwin on the Spey. And that is a, an expedition in itself. There are people in this room, and I won't even look at them and name names, who found those journeys quite difficult or challenging or they learned a lot from them and that's one of the things with going on trips you learn a lot about your admin you learn a lot about your skill set you learn a lot about doing things efficiently if you're just sat in camp all day you've got all the time in the world and that's great it's a good way of developing skills previous presentation about the, the, the benefit of practicing uh, bushcraft skills close to home and you can find that on my on my website, previous Bushcraft Show presentation. But when you start going on journeys, you can then put those skills into practice and you learn about how to apply those in reality. And then you can start going on journeys to 
wilder places, more remote places, more unfamiliar places. And I would say generally it's a good idea to not bite off more than you can chew. We all get ambitious, but I think it's good to go to places and say, okay, let's stay within the bounds of sensibility and then learn what we can about operating in this environment. So a good example would be northern Sweden in the winter. It's pretty harsh there. It can be very cold. It can easily be down in the minus 20 Celsius, easily down overnight into the minus 30s in the, in the depth of the winter. So if you're going to go and camp there and journey, probably the best thing to do first is to learn how to camp there because you've got the time to work on the camping skills, you've got the time to work um, on how to operate, how to get enough firewood, you've got very short days, etc., etc. rather than trying to do tens and tens of kilometers as well as learn all those other skills. Because in that environment, if you make mistakes, you start getting frostbite, you start getting cold injuries, you start having serious consequences. Whereas if you don't put your tarp quite right, Yara, if you don't put your tarp quite right, <laughs> Here you're going to get a bit wet maybe, yeah? Where, whereas if you don't do things quite right there, you're going to lose fingers. So um, think about consequence. Consequence, build up the basic skills. So that's what I'm talking about, an exped where you're really just going to gain an understanding of how to operate in the environment before you're ever really trying to cover any great distance. And this is what we did initially. I had worked a lot with Lars Fault, and I, myself and some friends, wanted to go and do more journeys where we really went out, took all of our kit, took all of, you know, toboggans, heated tents, etc., etc., and went for, you know, a number of weeks. And what we did initially was took baby steps. Okay, how do we pack the toboggans? How do we get all of this sorted? How do we, how much time do we need to set up camp? How much time do we need to source firewood? But we didn't really do much traveling. We did a little bit, we, and then we also went out and back to see how far we could go in a day under different, under different, um, conditions, different snow conditions, etc. When we built up a database of how, of how much we could manage in a day, how, how efficient we could be, etc., etc. We also looked at some of the classic bushcraft skills that are um, available in that environment. Long log fires, um, snow generators, like water generator bags, and lots and lots of things that we, um, we'd done before, but put, you know, put ourselves in a position where we're camped out in the middle of nowhere, going out and doing those things and using that tent as a base. And then we progressed on to doing journeys where, so another emergency snow shelter, doing journeys where we're, where we're traveling. Compare that to, for example, something like this blood vein journey, blood vein river in, in uh, Ontario, Manito Manitoba. So it's on the border between Ontario and Manitoba. Um, starts off in Woodland Caribou, flows out towards Lake Winnipeg. Um, You've got to, you know, you, you've got to start at A, you're dropped off by float plane, and then you've got to get to B. And we'll come back to this um, in a little while. But every day you're traveling, you're applying your canoe skills. That's not the place you want to be learning some of these skills. You want to have developed them in a more structured way, closer to home, on smaller trips, and then apply them. Because every day you're stopping on a new campsite, you have to be efficient with your fire lighting, your shelter construction or your tarp setups, etc., etc. Because the next day, if I can get the next slide, the next day you're onto a new part of the river and you're traveling and all of it beautiful, but all of it varied. Some days quite calm, but always onto a new campsite, wonderful camping spots. You don't have a lot of time to be developing new skills when you have to get down the trail, you have to get down, you're developing experience, but each day you, you're applying the skills that you've got already, you're applying your journeying skills. There's not a lot of opportunity to be developing new bushcraft skills um, when you have to be spending most of the day going from A to B. So that's what I mean by the difference between expeds to, to learn the skill set and expeds to actually just cover the ground. And once you do start traveling from A to B and make, having to cover the ground, you have to rely on your skills. The skills have to work. If you get to the end of the day and you're cold and wet and tired you, and you're relying on a fire for cooking and for getting people warm, your fire lighting has to work. Yeah, your fire lighting skills have to work and you have to rely on your skills. If you're traveling by toboggan and you get to where you're going to camp, it's cold, you're just in a cold lake crossing, you come up onto a swamp, you go across the swamp into the tree line, 
you have to get that platform flattened, get your heated tent set up, go and get firewood, saw it, split it, get the stove going, etc., etc. all while managing your clothing, managing yourself, managing um, to avoid cold injuries. And so when you're in that environment, when you're moving through the environment, your journeying skills need to be good and your camp skills need to be efficient. Yeah? But if you've pr spent the time practicing things close to home, you spent time in those environments, honing the skills in that environment, then it all works quite nicely. Okay? And this takes us back to some of the history of bushcraft. Um, anybody know who this gentleman is? That's Frederick Russell Burnham. And if you've not read Scouting on Two Continents, I'd recommend it as a, as a very good read. Um, he was a scout in North America and he was a scout in Africa. And these guys relied on their bushcraft. Yep. And he um, was a mentor in some ways to this gentleman, who many more of you might recognize, Faden Powell, father of the scouting movement, certainly here in the UK. Um, again, a lot of what he brought in was down to his experience in the Boer War and um, also Russell Burnham had an influence on that. Okay? Those guys were relying on their skills. And bushcraft has a history both in terms of indigenous skills as well as expeditionary um, efforts, expeditionary warfare, um, colonialism. Um, interesting podcast that I recorded with Lisa Fenton. Um, anybody here heard that? No? Got lots to listen to. Yeah. So I did a podcast with um, Lisa Fenton who spent a lot of time, she basically did a doctoral thesis on um, some of the relationships between bushcraft and indigenous skills and indigenous knowledge acquisition. But a big part of that was also the relationship with, um, the cultural relationship with uh, colonialism and people like Russell Burnham and people like Baden Powell and it's very interesting where bushcraft comes from it comes from people having to rely on these skills for their day-to-day -day life and one of the most important skills is your firecraft yeah if you're at the end of the day I don't know if you can see it there's lots of rain hitting that water there if it's the end of the day and you've got cold wet tired hungry people you need your firecraft to work okay you can practice these things at home or close to home and then you can make them work out in the field. And even in places like this, you might think, well, how is my woodcraft and my fire lighting skills gonna be any use on the Hardanger Vidder in winter? Well, you might be staying in a hut. Hopefully you are staying in a hut, because staying in a tent in the mountains in Norway in winter is quite a miserable experience after a while. They're cold tent. You can't take a hot tent because it's too heavy if you're ski touring. So if you're skiing from hut to hut, once you've dug yourself in, and you need to get the, uh, the fire going. And feather sticks are very useful in that environment as well. There will be a log store there. And you can leave this for other people as well. Even if you don't find the hut like that, that might be very useful to, some, to someone. Um, one of the last times I did a ski tour in Norway a few years ago, we were already in a hut and the weather was horrible. So we decided just to stay put for the day. And a couple of guys came in from the opposite direction to where we were going, to the opposite direction to the one that we were going. So they'd had the wind behind them. We would have had the wind in our face, which is one of the reasons why we decided to stay put. Um, they came in and the first guy who came in, um, he started speaking to us in Norwegian. And we said, oh, actually, we only understand a few words of Norwegian, we're, we're English. And he was like, oh, okay. And then proceeded to start speaking English, but then just went back into Norwegian. He couldn't speak English because he was so cold. And he was like, he was really struggling. And he literally then spent the last, the, the next three to four hours sat almost on top of the stove, which of course we had going. And so people will go into huts very cold. And if you can leave them in good condition, that's really good etiquette. If you can leave them um, with your really nice feather sticks, as well as it being useful to you when you get there, if you can leave it like that, it's fantastic. And it's something you can practice at home. You can practice your knife sharpening, you can practice your feather sticks, and then you can apply them on journeys. Yeah, it's a great skill set. We don't use it a lot of the time, maybe 10% of the time when we're lighting fires. Often we're going to be using small stick fires, but when you do need it, it's super, super useful. 
Yeah, so practice your firecraft, make sure it's really efficient. But journeying makes it more and more efficient. Do I ever really use bow drill on a, on a journey? Sometimes, but it's more for specific purposes, which I'll come on to. Water. A lot of people get confused about water purification. It also actually, I know because people ask me a lot of questions about it, it stops people going out. They worry about water. They worry about the cleanliness of water. They worry about what they have to do to make it safe to drink. Um, boiling kills all pathogenic organisms. Yep. Rolling boil below 2,000 meters, 6,000 feet is enough to kill all pathogenic organisms. No, it won't deal with chemical pollutants, but if you're out in the wilds, there probably aren't chemical pollutants, apart from a few, few places where it's probably well documented, documented. So boiling is really, really good, but again, that goes back to your firecraft a lot of the time. Yep. Above 6,000 feet or 2,000 meters, rolling boil for three to four minutes. Also understand the technologies that are available to you. Filter bags, dromedaries, know when it's safe to drink water in places and know when it's not safe. I'm ha I'll happily drink water in the mountains in Scotland. I won't happily drink water out of rivers in Canada where there's um, beaver, where there might be giardia, for example. So get used to un and understand how filter systems work, what they filter out. Micro filters filter out large pathogenic organisms like giardia, cryptosporidium and other protozoa. Understand this, this is all stuff you can learn and then you've got the skill set for traveling. Yeah, and this is on one of our Canadian trips, guys using the same sort of catadin filter system. Great for during the day, you can't be bothered to have a fire, you don't have the time to have a fire, stopping at lunch, fill up the water bottles, hot day, you want the water, and then in the evenings you can have a campfire. So these things are not mutually exclusive either. A lot of people think, I'm doing a canoe journey, what should I do? Should I have a fire? And, and boil water or should I use a filter system or should I use chemicals there's nothing to stop you using them all at different points of that journey depending on what's pragmatic at the time you also may be presented with things that you haven't used before so understand the principles rather than just be wedded to particular bits of kit that's one of the things you find as you travel more widely you don't always have all of your own personal perfect kit with you Foraging for food, now here's a romantic notion. Yeah, we're gonna travel through this environment really hard and we're gonna live off the land as we go. Yeah. If you're thinking about having some mint tea or nettle tea, that's probably realistic. Yeah, and you can find these things in a lot of places. Yeah. Um, and then you can also experiment with things that you're not used to, like Labrador tea. Yeah, so in the rhododendron family, Ladum. Um, a rhododendron greenlandicum this one that's the one you want to use the other ones are a bit toxic well even this one's a bit toxic but you don't want to boil and boil and boil and boil it but you can experiment with new forage foods as you go but do be careful of course yeah um, on courses here we might be foraging for cattails anybody on my plant walk this morning yeah so we talked about getting cattails out of a pond there's some people doing it yeah yeah, and there's some being roasted on the embers. Some of the rhizomes being roasted on the embers. Really good, good source of carbohydrate. We also might dig for burdock roots. Here's some guys using digging sticks, digging for burdock roots. They've already chopped the leaves off because they're going to use them for wrapping food to cook under the fire. That's all great to do, but trying to do that while you're co covering distance in an environment is very, very difficult. Um, so here's um, a, a scene from Canada. Rife with cattail and other usable foods, but you don't really have the time to forage for them if you're actually covering lots of ground. Wild rice, something you find alongside rivers. This is on the blood vein again. Um, that's all wild rice at the side of the river. And this was uh, collected by native people, but it never all is ripe for collecting at the same time. So you'd have to go through with a canoe bash it into your canoe, collect it in the bottom of the canoe, and you'd have to do that over time in a particular area to collect enough food. You simply don't have the time to do that on a journey to collect enough, to collect enough food. It's a nice thing to show to people. Um, if you were camping in that area for some time, yes, you could start using that as a food source, but if you're traveling through, you don't have the time. Yeah, that's not a very good picture. It's very pixelated. It's the best one I could find of that particular scene I was thinking of. Back in the day of the voyageurs, 
Yep, again, they didn't live from the land when they traveled. They had a job to do. They had to get out um, from Quebec or from Hudson's Bay and they had to get out into um, the country and take the trade goods um, in the spring and come back with the furs before the freeze in the autumn. They didn't have time to mess around picking roots and, and berries and things. They may have collected some stuff um, just as an aside, but they had prepared food that they took with them. Yeah. They had pemmican and other supplies that they took with them. Nothing has changed yeah, in terms of the, if, you, if your priority is to cover ground, you don't really have the time to live off the land at the same time. You certainly don't have the time to live off the land and get the calories that you need to hump the loads that you, you're humping on trips, portage packs, canoes, covering scores of kilometers every day. But what you might be able to do is get handfuls of berries at certain times of the year. Very easy to collect blueberries or blaeberries or, um, or whatever is available. And that, things that you're familiar with even in unfamiliar parts of the world. Rose hips, that's out in the wilds in Canada somewhere. Um, a very similar mountain ash to what we get in the UK. Fungi as well. If you're good with your fungi and you're traveling at certain times of the year, it's a tasty addition to meals. Yep, so you can get things that are easy to identify. I've certainly collected Lexinums and Boletus and Cantharellus and stuff on trips, but it's not what I'm planning to rely on. It's just an extra bonus, the same as the berries. Yep, and you can also learn about local wild edibles as well. And um, we were talking about um, dogwoods and cornus this morning on my tree and plant walk. That's bunchberry, one of the North American uh, forest floor plants, which has an edible berry. Fishing is a good expedition skill, particularly if you're traveling by canoe. Yeah, this is something that is um, reliable. It's something that isn't romantic. If you've finished at the end of the day, really good time of day to be, to be, uh, to be fishing. That's on the Blood Vein River in Canada, and that is a very happy client who's just caught the fish very easily. They're not used to being fished, the fish there. Um, Northern Pike, and that can be an extra extra little bit extra addition for your dinner and you might think about okay we're going to take our core starch staples calorie foods with us and we'll fish along the way on a canoe journey and if you're half decent at fishing then you might stand a good chance of catching brook trout walleye pike etc etc that is not over romanticized but getting all of your calorific needs from the environment while you're traveling hard through it, it's not gonna happen, even if you take a rifle. Anybody who's ever done any stalking um, for larger game um, knows that that can uh, be very hit and miss. Campcraft, yeah. Simple stuff works on trips. We can do lots of nice elaborate cooking cranes and things and they can be useful, particularly when we've got fixed camps with lots of people but when you're on a journey, keep it as simple as possible. Occam's razor, the simple solutions are normally the right solutions. The simple answers are normally the right answers. Yeah, but be prepared to, be prepared to apply your basics in improvised and pragmatic and flexible ways. So here we are. Um, the main river, this is in Scotland, the main body of the river is over that bank on the right hand side. There's a dried up side channel here we were camped up in the woods, up, up there, but we didn't want to make a fire scar up in the woods. It was a really nice bluebell wood. Um, it was a little bit earlier than this time of year, last year. And so we took our, our, our fire and had it down on this dried up riverbed. Um, there was no danger of flash floods at that time of year, um, but it was, it was simple, it was quick, and it was easy to tidy up the next morning when we're leaving. So be pragmatic, yeah, fire sites, on some even remote places in Canada when you're doing trips they're easy to use and they're quick uh, but you have to be uh, maybe a little bit pragmatic compared to what you normally do yep this sort of thing is great and sometimes we do use it on trips if we're doing a little bit more elaborate cooking but sometimes you're just using very very simple setups this is on the shore of Loch Tay trip that I did with uh, spoons last year and we struggled to find a half decent campsite along this stretch of the loch and we ended up camping in amongst all these rocks and finding a couple of spots where we could bivy and 
drag our canoes in and the place where we could have a fire, but we had a comfy time and the view was absolutely fantastic. But had we been a bit rigid about, oh, well, we don't normally camp in a spot like that, we wouldn't have picked it. So be pragmatic. That's another thing that I've learned of doing lots of trips is just be pragmatic about applying the basics. Okay, have a good repertoire of food. Yeah, if you can cook well in camp, you'll be the favorite person in camp, trust me. Yeah, particularly on trips when flavors are important. So be good with your fire management, be good with your cooking, practice recipes at home, practice them in the house, practice them in the back garden, practice them on camp with your mates, and then when you do journeys, you'll be, yeah, okay, I don't even need to look at the recipe. Um, this was a situation where we had a bunch of ingredients left over and we were improvising based on what we knew and then we came up with a really nice garlic pan bread recipe which again some of you will have seen on my on my blog this is on a course where we're cooking with five dutch ovens all of which weigh about 14 kilograms you're never going to have that on a trip yeah not unless you're an absolute masochist yeah but the skills that you develop in being able to cook complicated meals like that when you're on a trip and you've got limited things so you know your outfit has given you one aluminium dutch oven and a few stainless steel cooking pots you can still cook good meals because you've got the core skill set and you can improvise so that's on a miss and ivy trip in canada yeah so we yes we're using the aluminium dutch oven with some coals on the top but we're using a stainless pot there with a lid turned upside down and some coals on top of that as well french toast made with leftover bread yeah and Again, cooking some good meals, but again, good, good skills with the fire and being pragmatic. Knots and bind craft are really, really useful. They're part of your camp craft, but being good with knots and being efficient with knots to set things up quickly. I remember when you guys came on the spay trip with us, you were surprised at how quickly we set camp up because all of this stuff we've honed. We're, we're quick, we're quick, we're quick with this stuff. And if you can be quick with tying guy lines on and doing um, hitches and getting stuff set up and setting things up in a way that's easy to take down as well yeah Mikey's gone now but otherwise I'd be taking the the piss out uh, the, the mickey out of him um, he took three and a half hours to pack up from a course that he did with us last week he's quite proud of that he's meticulous but you can't do that on trips you can't spend three and a half hours every morning packing your stuff you have to be quick Part of it is setting things up in a way that you can take down quickly. Don't forget your bushcraft though. Yeah, paracord and everything is great and we all use it and various other things, but this kind of skill set can be useful even on expeditions as well. And I'll come back to that. Navigation and wayfinding. You can't go anywhere unless you can find your way. Yeah. Personally, I do think this sits within your bush skills, your bushcraft skills, the ability to find your way um, your ability to look at foreign maps and understand what they're telling you. How are they the same as British maps? How are they different from British maps? How do the grid systems work? How do I make my GPS work with this system? Etc. 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 That's all part of your skill set. Yeah, being able to find routes while you're on the ground. Sometimes there's a nice little portage trail sign at the beginning of the portage but you are still got to find that that's only about that big on a tree and when you're going down a river trying to find that sometimes can be quite difficult but your way your, your map reading skills are important your ability to find routes through an environment is important as well hiking trip in Scotland small river crossing you can develop these skills over time so that you've got the ability to cover the route that you want to you've got different options we might have got to that and it might have been too full to cross um, we may have then had to go a different way so you need the navigational skills to have the flexibility to, to change your plan on the on the ground as well also knowing when you're at the limits of your navigational skills as well this is a couple of mates of mine on a on a ski tour in Norway and preparing to leave the hut and we're going out into pretty horrible weather but because we're competent with our navigation, not overconfident, but we were happy that we could navigate in those conditions. We were happy that we had the wind behind us, so it would blow us along a bit. We didn't have the wind in our face. Um, we got to the next hut uh, without too much difficulty, but it's, at times it did feel like navigating inside a white paper bag. 
Using the natural signs as well, very, very useful. Build your natural navigation skills. It's a really nice way of connecting with the environment. Tristan Gooley's work's been fantastic in highlighting lots of different nav natural navigation techniques. But in terms of making journeys, don't, again, basics are basics. Um, how does the sun move every day? Where is it going to be in the sky at different times? What does local noon mean? Um, what does the sun being over my meridian mean? When a shadow is going to be shortest? How much does the sun move in terms of degrees in an hour? All of those sorts of things are things that you can work out at home. You can work out where the sun's going to set, the sun's going to rise. How much daylight have you got where you're going? At the latitude that you're going on your trip, at the time of year you're going on your trip, how much daylight have you got? All of those things can be looked up before you go so you don't mess up on your trip. And again, how much moonlight are you going to have on your trip? What does the moon tell us about direction? Not that we're really going to ever be navigating at night most of the time on a planned trip, but again, it can be good to know how much moonlight you've got um, uh, so that you can operate maybe within the hours of darkness. Medicinal plants. This is something I have found useful from time to time on trips. There are common ones that we might know from home, like self-heal, Prunella vulgaris, that you'll find around the world. We looked at this one on my walk this morning, meadow sweet, Philopendula and Maria. Useful source of a, a natural source of aspirin. And then some other not so common ones that are useful medicinal, eastern white cedar. So if you're traveling in environments, maybe have a look into what some of the most common and easily used uh, medicinal plants are and what they're used for. Yeah, this is an example from a trip that I did. I um, capsized out of the canoe. It was only a small capsize, it wasn't a major thing, it was just one of those daft pratfalls, little rock ledge, didn't hit at the right angle, canoe went over. I tried to keep hold of um, my paddle, which I did, but in going out, I scraped my thumb on either the canoe, on one of the screws on the canoe, or on a rock underneath in the canoe. I don't know. I came out the river with a lump out of my thumb. It was only a bit of skin missing. Normally, it wouldn't matter, but after a number of days of it being a bit wet, um, because I'm canoeing, sometimes it got wet, it didn't dry out all the time, um, of it cracking, so it was, if I put a dressing on it, it got a bit damp. If I let it dry out, it then cracked. It started to feel like it was getting a bit infected, and it was certainly very sore. So what I did was I sourced this which is some balsam fir. And these have little blisters, which if you burst them, it runs clear. It's medicinal in the sense that it, it does have vitamin C in it, but more importantly, it's anti-inflammatory and it's antiseptic. And I put that on my wound, which did two things. One is it stopped it cracking up because it gave it some um, sort of flexibility. Um, and also it helps the healing process. Um, unfortunately, I, you can have a look at my thumb, it is still there, um, but unfortunately I don't have a, a photo of a sort of day by day of it getting better, but it then went from getting worse day by day to getting better. I just rubbed some of this on morning and evening in camp and that helped very nicely. So these things can be useful. I wouldn't have known that if I'd just been a canoer with uh, a first aid kit that didn't have the right things in it. So knowledge of trees and plants I think is key. We can all identify birch trees. If we know silver birch here, we can probably identify a paper birch elsewhere. It has very, very similar properties. We can light fires with it, etc. It's great. But learning to identify a balsam fir, which that is, might take a little bit more practice. But if you take the effort, you get the rewards. Um, balsam firs have little, little uh, sucker-like attachments to the, to the twig. They've got very white stomatal bands underneath. They've got a little notch at the top and you can learn to recognize them. And they have those blisters. This is a plant you find in Scotland, but you also find it right around the Northern Hemisphere. This is bog myrtle. Does anybody know what bog myrtle is good for? Insect repellent. Yeah, it is. You rub it on your skin and it works okay. Yeah, it's got these very noticeable buds. Um, that's what the leaf looks like. That's what the flower looks like there at the end. That's a good one to recognize. You see it far and wide. This is a good one to know if you're going to North America. Anybody know what that is? Can't see at the back, I know it's difficult. That's the leaf. Poison ivy. Toxicodendron radicans. That causes a nasty contact 
reaction if you come into contact with it. That is on a portage trail. That log is across a portage trail. You wouldn't want to be touching that. Um, it has leaves in threes. Um, it looks a bit almost waxy around the edges. And if you see that in or near camp, you need to be careful because you don't want to be coming into contact with it. You certainly don't want to be going to the toilet anywhere near it. Squatting down on that would be a bad day out. Cutting tools, of course, goes without saying that one of the things that sets bushcraft apart from maybe other outdoor activities or aspects of the outdoors are our use of cutting tools. And this is a range of cutting tools of one of the guys who works with me. Yeah, all of his favorite cutting tools, if you like, his bushcraft knife, the, the buck saw he made himself, his axe, his adze, pocket knife, carving knife. We're not necessarily going to have all of those things on a trip. We just can't carry everything just in case. Now, we can't take the kitchen sink mentality to, to, to trips. And um, I saw a funny uh, cartoon the other day where somebody said, oh, yeah, I've got my bug out bag, bag ready. And it's this guy under this massive pack. Yeah. Um, we can't take everything we might ever need under every circumstances. We have to look at the type of trip we're going to do and take things that are widely applicable, that are going to be useful under lots of circumstances, that are going to be realistic. You know, so if we're going to the tropics, we might take a machete or a parang. If we're going to the northern forest, we might take a sizable axe. Um, we might take a, a saw with us as well. If we're going on a summer trip in the boreal, we might take one axe between a few of us. If we're going on a winter trip in the boreal, we might take several axes. Um, it depends on how much work we're going to do, how much fuel we need, um, how many days of uh, hours of daylight we've got. We also need to learn how to use our tools safely. We can do that at home. Yeah, people ask me um, which is my favorite tool to use, and I would say it's the axe, but I still use it as little as possible on trips because then I minimize the chances of me ever injuring myself with it. I don't use it for the sake of it, but learn to use your tools closer to home. This is in the Lake District. Um, and then you can start applying those skills. You can, you can learn them and learn to apply them precisely. And then you can apply them further afield. So this is a winter trip in Northern Sweden or a canoe trip in Canada. Skills that are developed closer to home and then applied efficiently overseas. Again, winter trip in the boreal forest tree felling, sectioning, we need all of that for um, the stuff that we're doing. It becomes a necessity of the trip. It's something we might practice out of um, enjoyment as a hobby at home, but when we start making trips where those skills really count and you need to rely on them, they become a necessity. But it also is a necessity that you don't injure yourself while applying them. You might also end up using tools that are not yours. So being able to pick tools up and check whether they're safe to use. Um, you probably can't see, but the axe at the back has got horrible overstrike damage on it. That half the handle's gone. It was the head was loose. The wedge wasn't in it properly. I wouldn't want to be swinging the axe around. It's not safe. Um, but you will find things like that in sheds, in and huts around the world. So understanding the limitations of tools as well is important. Um, you shouldn't bat on with a mora. So I keep being told. <laughs> That's why, I didn't break that one, a student broke that one. That's a standard Mora clipper. They do break occasionally when you bat on with them, which is fine if you're in the woods close to home. You know, they're kind of almost disposable. I don't like thinking of things as disposable. We like to keep things, um, but they do, you know, if knives are not strong enough, they will break. Um, and it happens, a few percentage of them maybe break when you're doing things with them they're not really designed to do. So if you're going to do those things, or there's a chance you're going to do those things on trips when you can't replace your tools, if you break them, choose something that's stronger. Yeah, make an informed choice about what is the most appropriate tool to take. Is it the biggest, thickest, strongest, indestructible one at the top? Or is it something a bit further down, which is still stronger than the basic knife, but is light enough that it's justified in your kit? because weight is always a consideration as well. Get trusted tools that you know that are going to work. You can see how well used they are. Yeah, they'll be on lots and lots and lots of trips. And you come to trust certain tools in certain environments. But just be realistic, don't be romantic. Preventing degradation. So tools, again, you ain't, you're not going to have your 200, 800, 1200, 6000, 8000, 
Nagura stone, water stones, everything with you as you, when you go, your different grades of stropping paste, different strops, grinding wheel, polishing set. You're not gonna have all of that on a trip, so learn how to sharpen stuff. It's, not, it's fine doing that at home. It's fine having a shed tricked out with all the different water stones, polishing paste, smurf poo, all that stuff. Yeah, I've got nothing against that stuff. But on a trip, it doesn't make sense. You've got to carry as little as possible and do the most with it as possible. So learn how to do that. Learn how to sharpen all of your tools with a pocket stone. Learn how to sharpen your knife on an axe stone. Learn how to sharpen your axe with a DC4 or whatever, uh, or a double or a Spyderco double stuff, and um, be good at it. Make sure you look after your kit on trips. Get into good routines. Yeah, this is another thing. Get this section is called preventing degradation. What happens on trips over time is you degrade and your kit degrades unless you get into good admin routines. So airing kit off, hanging it up even if it's under your tarp while you're having your breakfast. Yeah, hygiene. Yeah, it's important. Looking after yourself. After a week, you need to cut your nails. Maybe you want to have a shave. You certainly um, want to wash your hair. Uh, all of those sorts of things you need to do, otherwise you start to degrade, you get sores, you get chafing, you get um, itchy scalps and infestations and infected toenails and all sorts of things, which is not good. Basic hygiene is important. Organizing your kit before you go, knowing where everything is, making sure it's all in good order before you leave. It is part of your skill set. I don't focus a lot on kit, but particularly if you're doing a winter ski tour in Norway in the winter, um, well, I said winter twice there, winter, winter, winter. Um, you need to be organized, you need to make sure everything works. Yeah. And then one of the things for me that I think is really valuable about doing trips, particularly trips with clients, is developing techniques and knowledge in context. And what I mean by that, I'll give you some examples. So on a Miss and Ivy canoe trip, where you're canoeing through a beautiful environment like this, of course, you're working on the journeying skills. You're working on your paddling. You're getting better at your paddling. Your, um, your fire lighting is becoming more efficient because you're having to do it in a short space of time in the morning and the evenings. Your portaging skills are getting better. Your packing and unpacking skills are getting better. Your routine gets better. Um, but we can also learn other things while we're there. We can, if we're interested in bushcraft, which everyone here seems to be, you're at the bushcraft show, then we can also work on other things. It's a little bit low down. It's a little bit cropped there. But she's very happy because she's just got her first Baudrill ember. Yeah, under a tarp on a rainy day in camp where we decided to stay put for that day. I went into the woods and I got some bols dead standing balsam fir and made a Baudrill set. And then under that tarp, which I don't know, I can't remember what, what tarp it was that we got from the outfitter, we made embers. And these people are very happy. They're learning skills in the context. You can see how bedraggled Steve's looking there. Um, but he's just got an ember too and you, it's, there's something quite special about going into the environment getting the things that you need and making the fire there and then and learning the skills in context the same as learning more about the wild foods and um, this is something we discussed this morning on the on the walk gelder rose it's in flower around the lake at the moment it's the one that has the slightly pungent center flower and it has the sterile big pretty white flowers around the outside um, this is what the berries look like. This is in Canada. They have the same species. There are a very similar subspecies. And the interesting thing is here in Europe, you read a foraging book and it says that this plant is slightly toxic and you shouldn't eat it and it tastes disgusting. Um, in Canada, you read um, accounts of native use of this plant and they used to use the berries as food. So it's interesting to me, okay, do they taste different to here? Do they, um, is there something different about the plants? And I've tasted the, the berries here and they do taste quite unpleasant, but most of the unpleasant taste is in the skin. And then you read an account of First Nations using this basically by putting the berry in the mouth, chewing it up a bit, sucking out the, the, the nice juicy center bit, spitting out the skin and spitting out the pip. Yep, this is what the leaf looks like. It's Viburnum opulus. It's a native plant here. Many of you might know it, but if not, there's plenty of it around the lake here. That's what the berries look like and that's what the flat pip in the middle looks like. So you don't want to be eating that. It's kind of like the consistency of the seeds that you get in um, 
red peppers, you know, or green peppers, capsicum, um, but it's bigger. You can see my finger there for scale. So basically, I, ha I tried this, eating the berries, chewing them, sucking the juice, spitting out the, um, the skins and, and the seeds. And it was quite tasty. You don't get the bitter aftertaste that you get if you chew the skins up too much. And I didn't have an upset stomach. So that was quite an interesting little experiment that I did in context in that environment. So you can expand your own knowledge. Also, you get exposure to other cultures and environments when you travel. And again, within the context of bushcraft, if you look for these things, you'll find them. So here we are on a trip in Canada, um, up on um, Artery Lake before we're heading down the Blood Vein River. And there's a really um, nationally significant rock art site uh, there, where there is all this red ochre rock art that's been painted. Um, a lot of it done with sturgeon oil and ochre mixed together. And there are buffalo on there, there are shaman, there's this water serpent that flicks the canoe over. And um, it's really quite fantastic to go and look at. Um, particularly when you realize that there were no buffalo within 100 kilometers of that lake, even when there were buffalo roaming on the plains in Manitoba. Um, you can also see, similar to how some of the rock art is in Africa, where they've drawn the feet um, almost like this is what the print looks like. So it, it's interesting to, to get exposure to different cultures via your journeying. You get to camp in some wonderful places. That was a view across the islands on Brunswick Lake um, on our Miss and Ivy trip last year. And Brunswick Lake was one of the most significant, uh, was the site of one of the most significant Hudson's Bay trading posts in that area. That was down the other end of the lake. But just an absolute wonderful place, visually, aesthetically, wonderful sunsets, but also a real sense of history there in terms of what went on with the fur trade. Wonderful spots that you can get to when you're journeying. This is Double Rapids on the French River. Not a particularly remote place, but a beautiful place nonetheless that you have to, uh, you have to canoe to get there. Africa, again, some real opportunities for learning. Um, indigenous skills there from people still, just about. Hand drill with a Hadza, cooking skills um, that I'd never seen before with Maasai guys there. Um, very interesting and things that you can bring back and bring into your own bushcraft practice when you travel and see these things. Um, and there's a, something really special about putting your head down in a camp when you know that it was a thoroughfare for voyageurs and explorers and um, uh, expeditions and um, people proselytizing and religious missionaries and just the sense of history on some of these routes is quite fantastic and to be sort of part of that culture on a canoe trip for some for example as the sun goes down you think well people camped here hundreds of years ago when this was the main means of transport it's quite special also of course nature one of the reasons a lot of us are interested in bushcraft is to get closer to nature to have a better relationship with nature a closer relationship to nature that was certainly one of the things that attracted me to bushcraft i was already making journeys i was backpacking but i had a, a stove and everything i needed and i was almost in a little bubble where i wasn't interacting with the environment at all i certainly wasn't um, collecting wild foods i certainly wasn't um, using medicinal plants. I wasn't even particularly good at fire lighting. I didn't know the, the properties of lots of different woods for feather sticks or for, um, for roasting or what have you. Um, and I didn't pay as much attention to what the wildlife was doing. But once you start getting into um, the different avenues of bushcraft, you start noticing a lot more and you have a lot more of an intimate relationship with the environment you're traveling through. So here, you can't really see the scale, but it's an area of flattened grass and vegetation where a moose has been sitting down. On a, again, just by the side of the river on a, on a canoe trip near where we were camped on one of our trips in Canada. You see amazing wildlife. Um, this uh, large owl on the, uh, on the Miss and Ivy that actually followed us for quite a while. Um, kept perching up and watching us and then flying down the river a bit more. Just special, special um, experiences that you get by being in that environment um, where there aren't many other people. And then you also see tracks, even if you don't see the animal. Um, here's some not particularly big bear tracks just down the edge of the river um, on that same Miss and Ivy trip.
So a couple of case studies to finish off with very, very quickly, and I will rush through these. Yeah. So hiking trip in northern Sweden. So not a winter trip, late summer trip. Um, and there isn't always a lot of autumn there. So this is the forest, kind of forest area we're hiking. This is within the Arctic Circle, um, sept early September, beginning of the moose hunting season, which is why you'll see that we've got some orange on it. Lots of skog, as they might call it on their map, a lot of boggy, um, a lot of boggy uh, ground in between the forests, lakes, rivers, um, quite wet, but really interesting to explore. No real trails around, a couple of snow machine trails that get used in the winter, but no real um, summer hiking trails. Really good place to just, you can just rock up, you can set up your camp, and we found some really nice camping spots. So we, were camp we were going quite simply, tarps. We had a group tarp, a small group tarp with a fire, there were three of us. But we were finding great, you know, it was just, it was like being a kid again, this trip. It was fantastic. In, we were doing a circular route and we didn't have a huge amount of time pressure and we were just exploring the woods. Great foraging at that time of year. So we were collecting a lot of blueberries, tons of those, as well as lingon and what we would call cowberries. And if you don't know, have a look on the underside of the leaves, little paws there can help you positively identify them. Horses hoof fungus, so we made um, we made tinder, and we just had a great time. And then we camped up on this um, this area, and it was getting colder day by day. We camped up by this lake. It was quite cold. One of the ways you can see it's quite cold is the smoke isn't really going up. It's going up and then going sideways. That's often a sign that the weather's getting colder. And then next morning, I woke up. I was like, "What is that on my face?" It was snow drifting, just flut flurrying underneath the side of my tarp. But again, it didn't phase us. Yeah? Our tarp skills are good. Our fire skills are good. We've got the right clothes. Our admin is good. We didn't let our kit degrade in the wet rain and bog that we'd been traversing for previous days. And we were happy and we had fun. And we finished by clambering, taking a shortcut back over the top of a mountain. Um, that's the top of the hill. It was, only, it was only about 800 meters, but we've all done plenty of stuff in Scotland in the winter as well. And all of those skills come together to make something that would be an ordeal for some people be a fun adventure for us. And I think that's what it's about. All of those skills coming together, not necessarily hardcore. You know, I'm not living um, out there in my underpants using bow drill, but we're using the skills as, a, as we need them as we travel through that environment. Second case study, and this is um, the last one, three minutes left, um, into Canada, into the beginning of the blood vein on one of the blood vein trips that we did. Things didn't quite go to plan. These are the stories that people always like uh, when things don't go to plan. So it's about a 40 minute float plane in, float plane flight in, and then you land on a lake and you take your canoe off and you take your gear off. And there were six of us and rules are in Canada now that you can only put one boat on the outside of, a, of, a, of one of these uh, planes and you used to be able to put two. So basically we need, there were six of us, three boats, we needed three flights in. And the company that we were using has three planes, but it had been raining a lot in previous days and the, and the day before we flew out, the float plane company had been playing catch up, getting people out to fishing lodges, getting gold prospectors out to where they needed to be, etc, etc. The night before we were due to fly, one of the planes had broken down. So they only had two planes good to go the next morning. So one of the planes had to fly twice. So we had two flight, we had two planes go in and then one had to go back and get the rest of the people, the rest of the gear. Now, some of these pilots can be quite stroppy, particularly the older ones. And the plan, as far as we were concerned, was two guys in each plane with one boat and their own personal gear and some of the group kit. But what ended up happening was the first two planes that went out, five of us went out and some of the gear and one guy, which is Ray Goodwin, got left back on the dock for the final flight. Then what happened was this. Yep, it just, the weather closed in, it was murky. Those planes don't have sophisticated navigation systems. They wouldn't fly in that low cloud and rain. So we were out there um, without a lot of the group kit one of the guys didn't have his personal kit apart from his um, day pack and 
we had no way of getting out and Ray had no way of getting in, so we just had to sit tight. Um, most of the kitchen equipment was with Ray. We had the fresh meat. Um, some of the other fresh food was with Ray. Um, so it messed all of our menu plans up right from day one as well. One of the guys didn't have a tent or a sleeping bag. This, is, this could be a scenario on a, on a course, couldn't it, or a, a test. So one of the guys had a little personal tarp. Oh yeah, because the group tarp was with the kitchen kit. Um, so we made this like windbreak with the canoes. We put the little personal tarp up. We made a fire because the fire skills are there. Um, and we got comfy and um, plenty of birch bark, easy to light the fires. And we had a great old time. But what we also needed to do was we had to cook our dinner. We had steaks, but we had no frying pans or cooking pots or anything. So we made, just, just apply your bushcraft. Okay, so make a little griddle. Going back to the cordage point, I said we'd come back to it. Yep, roots, spruce roots, strip them off, split them down, great bindings. So use your knots again, clove hitches, etc., etc. It's not difficult to make these things if you know how. Yeah, make a really good one, roast the, bake, roast the steaks, cook the steaks one, uh, one evening, next morning bacon. Lee even made a little stool for himself to sit on. We had that much time. We were comfortable. We all chipped in with, with um, clothing to, so the guys stayed warm overnight. They didn't have a sleeping bag and he stayed in a small two-man tent with one of the other guys and they were nice and cozy. So we improvised. Yeah, we had to improvise a little bit with the water purification, we had to improvise with the cooking. And then we did a two week trip because Ray managed to come in the next morning. There he is looking very dapper with his trousers rolled up, taking his boat off, we got the rest of the gear. And then we did a two week trip. And do you know what the guy said the best part of the trip was? That first day when we had to improvise. Yeah, so it's, it's one of those things that it sticks in people's memories and it's nice to be able to apply your skills in a positive way even when you are um, in a slightly difficult situation. So I would, I, I put this on my talk last year, make journeys, make voyages, attempt them, there's nothing else. Well I think there are other things but I think they are a great thing to do and they're a great way for you to apply your bushcraft skills, um, be pragmatic, learn as much as you can close to home, step up what you want to do you don't all have to do journeys but if you get the opportunity to you really will learn a lot and it's a it's a fantastic way of making your bushcraft skills make sense and putting them into context and then you can bring what you learn back and share them with other people because at the end of the day what a lot of all of this is about and why we're all here is sharing the knowledge and sharing the skills i've tried to share some of what i've learned with plenty of trips over the years there hopefully some of that made sense to you and thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. I've gone over time. I have a, a few minutes for questions, apparently. No, we. Uh, what we did was we just got some spare layers and made like a sleeping mat for him and then we got a couple of fleeces and things that he kept most of his clothes on put a couple of things over the top of him and he was quite comfy but he went in one of the guys had a small two-man tent as his personal tent and that was big enough for the extra guy to get in but it was a small enough space that it was quite cozy yeah thank you very much cheers <laughs>